<laughs> We're doing the sunrise service here because the sun is just rising. I don't have any lights on here. So the sun will, it will be getting lighter, but most important is hearing, not seeing. As Prabhupada would sometimes say, what can you see with your eyes? But it's more important to hear. So today um, we're going to talk about Govardhan Leela. Govardhan Puja was, for us in America, was on Thursday. Today is Saturday. Today is November 10th. Govardhan Puja was on the 8th. Yes. So I thought we would talk a little bit about Govardhan Puja because we just had it and it's, it's always nice to continue the discussion and become more absorbed in the Leela. And then later this afternoon, I don't know if you know, but we arranged a class which would be 3 p.m. my time. We arranged a class and that will be for Australia. But of course you can attend. For you in England it will be 8 o'clock. I think Poland, it'll be nine o'clock. And then we'll talk more about Dhammadar Leela. And Sunday we're not having class because we're having the Prabhupada's disappearance celebration and I'll be occupied in the morning at the temple. I, I want to be there to participate. So, Govardhan Puja is a huge festival. Uh, sometimes it is celebrated in a bigger way than even Krishna's birth, Janmashtami. So I don't know if you knew that, but it's a very special festival. And Vishnu Chakrabarti Thakur explains that this Leela was enacted by Krishna for three reasons. One was his concern for his devotee, Indra. Because Indra had become proud. And Krishna wanted to help him because the problem with pride is that it can destroy your bhakti. So Krishna wanted to help Indra, because Indra is his devotee and he's a demigod, he's in charge of universal affairs. So out of compassion for Indra, Krishna enacted this pastime. That was one reason. He also wanted to enact this pastime to create a festival which we could there, thereby enjoy um, for many years to come now, over 5,000 years, this festival has been going on and we're still relishing this festival. So Krishna created a Leela that was very, very special. Amongst all his Leelas, this Govardhan Leela was very special. And it became so special that it became an important festival. And then Krishna also wanted to give his devotees, his Bhajbasi devotees, the opportunity to associate with him nonstop for seven days, which which never happened before. And if you if you understand something about Krishna's pastimes, usually there's a time that Krishna is with his friends, there's a time that he's with the gopis, there's a time that he's with his mother. But generally they're not all together. Sometimes it may be, but even even when they're all together, it's it's not it's one rasa predominates and, and it's focused on one rasa. In this, all the rasas were together, all the devotees were together, and so Krishna was blessing them. And Krishna knew, especially for the gopis, it was really hard because Krishna was a man and they were married. And so it was really hard for them to associate. So he gave them the opportunity. So those are the, the three things. And of course, when you read the pastime, then you'll you'll understand that there are many other things are being taught, subtle things. So, because Krishna can do many things at one time, so it's just so interesting when Krishna wants to do something. He thinks, well, you know, I'm going to the store, but in the on the way to the store, I could do this and that and that. So, we need to we need to help Indra, and I can also do so many things. So. Krishna, he has, he has um, a sense of what's going on with his devotees. Um, Indra has a tendency to become angry and proud. And 
both are very destructive to bhakti. And so Krishna, sensing that, wanted to perform a lila to humble Indra. Because humility is really Krishna consciousness and pride is, is the opposite of Krishna consciousness. So if you might say, I can only become humble if I'm Krishna conscious. But however you look at humility, humility is Krishna consciousness. And without it, we won't be Krishna conscious. So Krishna is being kind and Indra. So you probably know the story, but we, we can discuss it and maybe discuss some things you don't know. <clears throat> so every year Indra was worshipped because the cowherd men, their main service, Nanda Maharaj, excuse me, <clears throat> as coward men, their main, their main occupation was cow protection, taking care of cows. It wasn't business, it wasn't money lending, it wasn't agriculture, it was cows. That's how they maintained themselves. So they would worship Indra because Indra would supply rain and with rain cows would have grass. So they were organizing this festival and Krishna, he wanted to anger Indra. He wanted to put Indra in his place. He wanted to show Indra that he's not. He is not the Lord. Indra means Lord. He's not, he's not the Lord. So Krishna said, we shouldn't do this. Sacrifice. It's not necessary. And Nanamar says, well, you know, this is what we do every year because we need rain. We need rain for the cows, for the grass. And then Krishna, in order to dissuade his father and the other coward men, said something very interesting. He actually preached atheism. And he preached a philosophy that some people ascribe to, which is called karmavad or karma mimangsa. And this means that karma, the laws of karma, are absolute or supreme. And so if you do good work, there'll be a good result. If you do bad work, there'll be a bad result. And worshipping the demigods has nothing to do with it because the demigods are bound to give the result of your karma. And so karma is supreme. So you don't need to worship Indra because he has to award us our karma. And, and Krishna said, look, you know, sometimes Indra pours rain on the ocean. So this is, this is unconscious. If it's, if it's our karma, unconscious, it just means if it's our karma that there will be rain, it has nothing to do with Indra. He is obliged. There's nothing, so there's nothing beyond karma. So why are you worshipping Indra? And then he said, then Krishna said, even if you believe that there's a God and that God is in control, it's not true because karma is supreme and God has to work within the laws of karma. So if our karma is that there's going to be rain, then God has to give it. He can't do it. Other, he's subservient to those laws. So there's an atheistic philosophy, even... Um, he bring in God, it is an imperfect idea. It makes God subordinate to laws of nature. It makes us, it makes the modes of nature supreme. Karma and the modes of nature are controlling everything. There's nothing we can do about it. So, you might think, well, how is it that Nanda and the coward men would be swept off their feet by this idea? Well, they weren't swept off their feet by this idea as much as they were swept off their feet by Krishna's desire and Krishna's charm and Krishna's reasoning. So he was, he was basically begging them that I want you to um, give up this Indra Yajna and I have a better idea. And so he establishes, number one, you don't have to worship Indra so don't worry if you don't worship Indra. But you're going to get the rain anyway. But because you have all this paraphernalia, 
Really, it would be better to worship the Brahmins because by their blessings, we'll prosper. It would be better to worship the cows because we are, the cows are our subsistence, sustenance. Without the cows, we have no livelihood. And we should also worship Govardhan Hill because Govardhan Hill is the hill that provides the grazing land for our cows, Govardhan is providing the grass, and Govardhan is providing the water. So if we worship, if we take all this paraphernalia and we worship Govardhan, the cows and the Brahmins, that'll be much more powerful. And so everything that you've brought for Indra, now we should engage in the worship of Govardhan and gather up all the boga in the village and cook and offer everything to Govardhan. So, you know, Krishna is so beautiful. Krishna is so beautiful and charming that how could you resist whatever he says? It's just, you know, everyone follows Krishna. So even now, Krishna is saying something that he doesn't even believe. He's saying something that's wrong, but he's so charming and beautiful, everybody's following him. Wow, Ganapati's up. Are you up all night, Ganapati, or did you get up early? Well, it's not that early. It's like 6 o'clock your time. Okay, 6 o'clock is not early, just, just for the record. So... what they did is they just cook, 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 and they offered everything to Govardhan. And then what happened, Govardhan appeared as a deity, which was Krishna. And so Krishna appeared as this, as this deity and he ate everything and he, he wanted to show the residents of Braj that what they were doing was right. So by appearing at, as this deity of Govardhan and eating everything, he encouraged them that, yes, we've done the right thing. Govardhan has come. He's satisfied. And in the form of this deity, he ate everything. And after he ate everything, he said, Aniyora, Aniyora, which means give me more. And in Govardhan, there's a village where this happened, where this leela took place. And the village is, the name of the village is what? Aniyora, of course. So they kept feeding and he kept asking for more, and they kept feeding and asking for more. Nobody could figure out how to satisfy him. And then Balaram figured if we just put a Tulsi leaf, then he'll be satisfied. So they put a Tulsi leaf, and then he stopped saying on you, or he was satisfied, yes. So, so what happened now? All this worship for Indra. It's now being diverted to the worship of Govardhan. And who's doing this mischief? This boy. This little coward boy named Krishna. And Indra got really angry at Krishna. And it's interesting because naturally I'm sure you're thinking, well, doesn't Indra know who Krishna is? Doesn't Indra know that Krishna's God? And so, how could he become angry at God? There's a discussion we're going to read. I'm just waiting for it to become a little lighter. And there's a discussion we'll read about this. It's a very, very interesting discussion. It's in a commentary by Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur. And he's um, describing what he believes the conversation is, is between Indra and Krishna. And we're going to read that later. So don't go away. You don't want to miss that. So Indra, when he sees what's happening, he's thinking, like, who is this little boy? What audacity this boy has to stop my worship. And he became exceedingly angry, actually. He completely lost his mind. And he said, this kid thinks he can stop my worship. Well, I will show him. 
I will create a storm that's so severe that it will flood the whole village and all his cows will die and everyone will die. So he called for the what are known as Samvartika clouds. And those Samvartika clouds are the clouds that Indra calls at the time of destruction of the universe, when, when they're actually needed. So it is said in the Bhagavatam that the rain was coming down in pillars. So, you know, pillars are like, say, like this size, just... I don't know if you've ever seen water. You know, like a water, basically, it's like waterfalls everywhere. Water falls from the sky. And hail, it was hailing. And very windy. Could you imagine pillars of water instead of normal rain pillars of water? How much water that is? So what happened was, there was so much water that you couldn't see any hills anymore. It filled everything up, so there was no high or low. There was just water. It was just like, it was a mess. Anyway, the residents of Raja Raj were, were worried for their life because it was filling up. It was such a heavy storm. What to do, what to do. As we know, Krishna is their life and soul. And so they totally depend on Krishna, so in an emergency like this. Krishna, Krishna, help. So Krishna said, okay, don't worry, I will help you. So Krishna went to Govardhan, and Yoga Maya, through her expansion, created a situation where Krishna came there protected. No rain on him. And so he told all the inhabitants, you come to, to Govardhan Hill, and then I will protect you. So, as you know, he lifted the hill. But one interesting fact is that the hill is about, the walk is 14 miles. So, so it's like six, six or seven miles long because you go around a little bit. But let's say, let's say we can say seven miles long. So if it's 14 miles, seven miles in each direction, right? But the interesting fact is that the hill wasn't actually big enough for everyone to get under because there were too many people in Braj and Krishna was calling the whole town to come under. So Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says, and other acharyas say, that the hill expanded to 32 miles. Then it expanded. When Krishna touched it, he, Govardhan felt ecstasy and Expanding the body is an ecstatic symptom. So, out of ecstasy he expanded, but he expanded to fulfill Krishna's desire to protect the residents of Braja. So he expanded 32 miles. And when the Leela was over, then contracted. So 32 miles that everybody... That's a big space, 32 miles, isn't it? And then everybody, everybody could fit under the hill. I don't know how wide it was, but 32 miles long. So everyone could fit under the hill. So, as you know, as you may not know, but Bhagavatam says that for Krishna to lift that hill was like a child lifting a mushroom. It's like for him it's nothing. Why? Well, Bhagavatam gives the example that he's lifting universes. You know, planets are floating in space by his energy. So, to lift a hill, that's like lifting a mushroom. So, um, of course, everyone was astonished by this, Leela. And they were bewildered, like, who, who is Krishna? He must be, he must be God. You know, Krishna's always trying to hide his godliness, because that would ruin the relationship. But now, after this Leela, the residents of Braj are talking with Nandamaraj and saying, who is your Krishna? He must be God. But by Yogamaya's potency, they couldn't allow that, Krishna couldn't allow, Yogamaya couldn't allow that anyone would ever know his position. So Gargamuni predicted, or when Krishna was born, gave his astrology. And basically what 
Nana Maharaj picked up on was that Krishna is empowered by Narayan. And Narayan's working through him. That's why he does all these wonderful things. But really, he's just my son, but he's fortunate to have this Shakti of Narayan. So that, and then the cowherd men were satisfied with that, because otherwise, how could you explain that Krishna's lifting up a hill and not even bothering him, and he's only seven years old? It doesn't make any sense, unless he's God or someone like God. They said, no, he's, he's just my son, but Narayan has empowered him. So, in any culture, the intimate mingling of man and woman is restricted. And in this culture, of course, in traditional Vedic culture, it's, it's very restricted, especially the mingling of an unmarried man with a married woman, which was the case with Krishna. And the husbands that the gopis had were not really their husbands or their love affairs. They're actually part of the Leela. They're just the husband is just an obstacle to get to get to Krishna. And the more obstacles there are, the sweeter it is when they get together. So the husbands play that role uh, of creating obstacles. So but still, externally, according to I'm a, I got up at two thirty. I went to bed like ten or something. That that's not much rest, is it? So Excuse me. I might fall asleep in the middle of a sentence, but I will wake up. I'll try to keep myself awake. So, so socially, just like totally unacceptable for Krishna to be with women. And if he, whenever he did it, he did it in the dead of night. Well, he would do it. It was just. It had to be. Clandestine. He would do it at Radha Kund also, noontime, and he'd have different Rasalila. But he couldn't just do it out in the open. It wasn't proper. And it wasn't even proper for these gopis to even look at Krishna. You know, just like stare at the face of a man, and you're already married, or vice versa. You're not married, and the girls are married, and you're staring at them. But this is what happened during this Leela. Naturally, everyone is looking up at Krishna. And so the gopis got to bask in the beautiful moon-like sunshine, moon-like effulgence of Krishna's face, and Krishna got to also see the gopis. Uh, I didn't read your previous comment. I'm half asleep. Um, sometimes I... Sometimes the previous comment... No, there was no <laughs> previous comment. You're innocent. There's no evidence of what you said. If you, um, anyway, if you want to make a comment, go ahead, because I didn't see the previous one. The one with smileys, I don't know. Oh, you put the wrong smileys in, okay. So now, Krishna, of course, Krishna knows everyone's heart. He knows what we want, and certainly Krishna knows the love of the gopis is so intense, they just want to be with him. But they can't, so that creates this separation, this intense separation. But now Krishna wants to fulfill their desire, so he arranges this leela, and so now they're with him for seven days nonstop, which otherwise would have been impossible. But that's true for all the devotees, and this is unprecedented, and all the devotees in the different rasas are together. That doesn't happen. Not, uh, not in this extended way. Looks like there's a storm coming as I'm telling the story. Okay, it's amazing. Let's see? There's a storm coming. Can you see? The wind is blowing. I can hear it. I think it's going to rain. 
Look what happens. We had, uh, I think we had, <laughs> after Govardhan Puja, we had Kirtan, the rain. So, Krishna, one thing, one thing that's so beautiful about Krishna is he knows the heart of his devotees and he loves to satisfy the heart of his devotees. Now, he doesn't love to satisfy them materially until they're pure, until they don't want the material thing. Then he likes to do it. Because if he does it before, it might be an impediment. But he loves to fulfill the desire for rasa, a relationship. And so that's what he's doing now. And everyone gets to spend seven days with him. And because they're with Krishna, nobody's tired like I am now. And I think it would be hard, you could imagine it hard to be tired looking at Krishna. So nobody's tired, nobody's thirsty, and nobody's hungry. And it's just, it's just amazing. They're with Krishna 24-7. So you could say, in a sense, transcending, completely transcendental, transcending time, transcending hunger, thirst, and so forth. So, wow, the interest, like, I don't know, he's sending. It's amazing. Sending it, maybe he's sending his some Bartika cloud now. So, now some interesting facts, other facts. Krishna lifted Govardhan. How high did he lift it? There were animals on Govardhan, and there were, you know, plants and vegetation. So Indra's throwing down this rain. And Krishna lifts Govardhan high enough that it goes above the clouds. So all the animals and, and vegetation on Govardhan are now not being touched by the storm. They're above the clouds. Isn't that interesting? And all the residents of Braja that Indra was trying to destroy are under Govardhan and Krishna's lifting this hill and Indra sees that and Indra understands that he made a big mistake and um, he withholds he calls back the clouds and the rain and so and the lightning and he realizes I have to apologize to Krishna and he is told, or I forget if he's told her he understands. I think he was told, he said, he said, if you want to apologize to Krishna, bring a cow, because wherever there are cows, Krishna is very, very happy, he's very satisfied. So bring a cow, he'll be appeased. So there's a place today near Govardhan, and it's called Govindakun, and this is where Lord Indra and the cow came, and the cow bathed Krishna in her milk. And Krishna was very, as Krishna is, he's forgiving. So he forgave Indra, and Indra at that point had given Krishna a name, Govinda, and that was the first time Krishna was ever given that name. And there's a kunda there, and the kunda is called Govinda Kunda. And that's where Lord Brahma, excuse me, Lord Indra came and worshipped Krishna and begged for forgiveness and um, explained to Krishna what a horrible thing he did, had done. Now, I want to find the conversation. It's so interesting. Um, Indra's demigod and a very exalted person, and he became very angry. So give me a moment here. I was doing something before class other than preparing for this. So I just have to go find the chapter. And... Uh, Mm. 
Okay. Excuse me for not finding the reference. That's um, my fault. Yeah, the so Indra. As we'll find in this conversation, Indra was overcome by anger. So, so this is chapter 27 of the Bhagavatam. Lord Indra and Mother Saravi offer prayer. So, um, so Indra, Indra came. It's described here that he was very ashamed because he realized that he offended Krishna. Mm. So this is what Krishna said. It was quite interesting. This is a uh, text two, chapter twenty seven, tenth canto. This is what Vishwanatha Chakravarti Thakur is saying that Krishna said. O king of the demigods, I see that you have unprecedented affection for me. You have come to show mercy to me, who have offended you by stopping your worship. So <laughs> Krishna actually said that. <laughs> that humble Indra it was kind of sarcastic. <laughs> oh. That's a good question. Katie's asking, well, the Brahma Samhita took place longer, so how could this be the first time Krishna was called Govinda? Yeah. No. Good question. Maybe the first time within this creation. Or maybe what is meant by this is that um, Krishna was never, you know, after this point, people would call Krishna Govinda, one who's giving pleasure to the senses, the cows, the planet. And somehow it didn't, I guess the name didn't stick. Maybe that's what it means. Mm. Yes. So, um, so Krishna is saying, you have offended. I offended you. Are you coming to show mercy? <laughs> So it's <laughs> it's kind of funny, right? Um, Indra was one offended Krishna, not the other way around. But Krishna says, "Are you coming because I offended you, and you're showing mercy, like you're forgiving me?" So, um, so now, Bhagavatam says. Indra's pride, when Indra saw what happened, his pride was smashed. Mm. And so, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, he's, he has insight into the conversation that may have taken place. And so this is, this is um, what he's giving us as the conversation that takes place. I want to read this and we can discuss it. So Indra is speaking, you know that I was so foolish that I stopped your worship. Um, excuse me, Krishna is speaking, you know that I was so foolish that I stopped your worship. And on the pretext of worshiping Govardhan, I enjoyed the offerings meant for you. This is what Krishna is telling him. He becomes Govardhan and he eats all the offerings. So actually, Krishna is playing with him and saying, really, I made an offense. 
So Indra, Indra was afraid that Krishna would say something like this because because Indra knows Krishna is is humbling him by saying this. So Indra says, "O oh Lord." I am so bewildered by your maya. I now know a little about you by a speck of your mercy. Indra said, so Indra starts now to describe Krishna's transcendental position. So he's coming from this point where he's not even recognizing Krishna and thinking that he has the right to retaliate against Krishna. And now he's glorifying Krishna as the Supreme Lord, uh, describing his transcendental qualities. Um, and telling him, you're not affected by the modes of nature, so you wouldn't retaliate. You wouldn't, um, you know, it was all my, he's basically saying it's all my fault, you didn't do anything wrong. So, Indra said, O oh Lord, if you have no desire to accept the modes of nature, how do their effects such as greed and anger appear within you? How could you... Um, this is not Indra, this is Krishna. If you have no desire to accept the modes of nature... How do their effects, such as greed and anger, appear within you? How could you stop my worship? No, this is Indra. Without the influence of the modes of nature. And without showing greed and anger, how could you punish the wicked to protect the principles of religion? Let me read the verse. Uh, try to follow this. I'll, I'm... Yeah. Let me read the verse. How then could there exist in you the symptoms of an ignorant person, such as greed, lust, anger, and envy, which are produced by one's previous involvement in material existence and which cause one to become further entangled in material nature? And yet, as the Supreme Lord, you impose punishment to protect religious principles and curb down the wicked. So he's saying, you're transcendental, but sometimes it appears that um, you're being influenced by the modes of nature because you might punish someone or appear to be angry or whatever, but it's not actually under the influence of the modes of nature. Um, it's to protect religious principles. So he's going on glorifying him. So here Andrew is becoming a little humble. Even fools like me who proudly think themselves universal lords quickly give up their conceit and directly take to the path of the spirit of spirit of the spiritually progressive when they see you are fearless even in the face of time. Thus you punish the miscreants only to instruct them. Mm. I end is admitting he's how what a fool he is. And um, saying, you know, you punish. You punish people like me, and I deserve it. And now Indra is saying, you know, I, I thought I was a controller. I give up that mentality. So Indra is becoming quite humbled now. And he's expecting to be punished, and he's telling Krishna, I don't know what kind of punishment you're going to give me, but I deserve it. So it's nice, isn't it? Like when you, like you make a mistake, you totally acknowledge the mistake, you're totally willing to accept the punishment, and he's, he, he's doing something which is very important. Or he's setting an example. If you ever make a mistake and you have to apologize then what are you apologizing for? You need to state what you're apologizing for. Like, if I say I'm sorry to you, you might think, what are you sorry for? Do you know what you did? I might just say I'm sorry because of something I did, but, but that's not really what hurt you. 
and then you want me to tell you that I'm sorry for this other thing, and I don't, then it's hard for you to accept my apology because I'm not realizing the pain I caused. So one of the things that Indra is doing is he's describing the situation, what he actually did. This is what I'm sorry for. So that's a lesson. Have you ever apologized? State what you did that was wrong. And then state how it made the other person feel, or you think it made the other person feel. And then state what problems it may have caused for the other person. So you're, 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 you're showing complete awareness of what happened, both what you did, the extent of what you did, and the extent of the trouble it caused the other person. Then when you apologize, then people can more readily accept it because they know that you understand what you did. So here Indra is totally understanding what he did. So it's a very good example. And humbling himself to admit that, I made a mis- that he made a mistake. Mm. And so here he's saying, this is text 8, Engrossed in pride over my ruling power, ignorant of your majesty, I offended you. O Lord, may you forgive me. My intelligence was bewildered, but my consciousness, but let my consciousness never again be so impure. So he's asking for forgiveness. Just like sometimes we do something under the influence of anger or greed or lust or whatever. And it's not really our intention, but we, we do it. And so Indra's in this mood, like, I, I, I just lost it. And I never want to do this again, and please forgive me. So that's, that's what we're supposed to do. Sometimes we make mistakes. Krishna, please forgive me. I'll never do this again. That's, that's the mood. And Krishna accepts that. She definitely accepts it. So here's a conversation that... Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur is saying, may have taken place. Something like this. It's interesting. These are insider secrets. Krishna might have replied, I lifted Govardhan Hill to protect Bhaja, not to punish you. Now I will call Yamaraj and arrange for your punishment. <laughs> Afraid of such a reply, Indra fearfully said, as the most famous father and guru, you are merciful by nature. Therefore, please forgive the offense of this foolish person immersed in pride and ignorant of your majesty. You should not purify me by punishment because I am like a stubborn animal. The moment after the master beats the animal, it again commits the same offense. Instead, you should purify me by your mercy so that my animalistic trans, uh, my animalistic tendencies do not arise again. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so what Indra's, Indra's, he's saying, well, if you punish me, that's not the best thing because I have this tendency to be proud and that is destructive. So, Rather than punish me, why don't you give me your mercy? Because you, if I get your mercy, then I'll, I'll never, it'll curb my pride. I'll never do these foolish things again. And that will help my bhakti, because without pride I can be your devotee. So that's nice. He's actually praying for what's important. And he's fearing that Krishna could punish him. And he's saying, I don't... I don't think punishment is a real solution. I need your mercy to become purified. So Radha Priya is saying, this position of apologizing and waiting for a punishment is fine when you apologize to anyone? Well, um, there can be different reasons you apologize. That sometimes you may apologize, but you realize you, you deserve to be punished and you, you're not asking not to be punished because you deserve it, you're just asking that that person be merciful on you and, and forgive you. If, if they want to punish you, or if Krishna wants to arrange to punish you, if that's what's necessary, then he'll do that. But sometimes what I find, because Krishna knows what's going on, and Krishna 
can inject certain feelings in people's heart. If you apologize and it's genuine and you're purified of the desire to do that same foolish act again, then you really won't need punishment. And so Krishna may pacify every, everyone from within their heart once you become detached. It's not conscious that they know what's going on. But Krishna knows, okay, you don't need punishment anymore because you've changed your mentality. Or Krishna may say, you do need punishment because you haven't purified your mentality and that punishment will help you. So sometimes if you're not completely detached, in a way that Krishna's, Krishna could see that you could commit this mistake again, then he may put the heat on a little more so that people are still upset with you or want to punish you. So for us, the apology is not so we won't be punished per se. It's so that um, we can invoke, we are trying to pacify the person we hurt, trying to rectify, remedy the situation. That's the idea. You know, we may be punished, we may not be punished. We will have to see what happens. But if we can rectify our hearts, then there's no need for punishment for purification, although punishment may come just because legally it may be necessary or that may be the need of another person. But repentance is the is most important. And you can be punished and it still may not help. Hmm. Hmm. Listen. Um, you should purify me by your mercy so that my animalistic tendencies do not rise again. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, this prayer is not offered with a completely pure heart because Indra is exhibiting humility in order to save himself. Indra mentions this in the seventh verse. Later in the tenth canto, we find that when Krishna once took a parijata flower from heaven, foolish Indra again reacted violently against the Lord. So, some insight here. Um, this humility is to save himself because he committed this huge offense and we have to suffer for it. So, Vishwanath Chakravarti Tagore is saying this. Humility is not really deep or genuine but it's motivated to save himself. So Andrew's got some ways to go. Krishna Karshani says, what about making the same mistake again? And even we want to change what to do, it seems we're not able to change. Hmm. Well, there are certain things we need to do to be Krishna conscious. So the proper attitude is, we just have to do it. Even if I'm making the same mistake. Yeah, I make the same mistake, but that means I may have to remain in the material world. So at least the premise is that we do, we can stop making the same mistake. And if we can't change, it's probably could be two reasons. One, you don't think you can change, so you don't really try or know how. Or you're so, so conditioned that you continually make the same mistake and all you can do is pray for forgiveness and pray to Krishna give you strength. You know, um, one of the principles in the 12-step program is when you get to this point where you can't change, then you acknowledge you can't change. And you acknowledge that there's a higher power. Uh, that higher power can help you change. So that's another thing we do when we can't change. We just, Krishna, I can't change. Can you, you know, I need you. I can't do this alone. So that's there. And you notice that we have a sofa in here. This is also my wife's office now. There used to be a desk there, right? We have a nice rug. 
And this is the office. And my wife does her counseling in here. So if you ever come to Alachua and you have marriage problems, then you'll come to this office and she'll talk to you here. And she'll kick me out. <laughs> no, I'll voluntarily not be here. Um, let's see what this, how this conversation goes. You descend into this world, O transcendental Lord, to destroy the warlords who burden the earth and create terrible disturbances. Um, so Indra is saying, you've appeared for our benefit because of our prayers, even knowing this, I have been blind and acted foolishly. Now having been punished, I can see the truth. You descend to destroy the demoniac warlords who harass the earth and to bring prosperity to those who faithfully serve your lotus feet. But I am neither of these. So you neither destroy me nor bless me. It is my great misfortune that you remain neutral. So, um, <laughs> so Indra continues, and this is what Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur is saying. Therefore, let me surrender to your lotus feet and offer you respects. Um, So Indra is paying respects now to all the forms of Krishna. I'm looking for that conversation where Indra is admitting how bad he is. He's offering respects to all the devotees, to the Lord. Yeah, here it is. Oh, it's such a great conversation. So this is text 12 of the chapter, Lord Indra and Mother Surabhi offer prayers. My dear Lord, when my sacrifice was disrupted, I became fiercely angry because of false pride. Thus I tried to destroy your cowherd community with severe rain and wind. So Krishna would say, O oh Indra, I can understand from your recitation of praises that you are my devotee. But without your sanction, the wicked Sambartaka clouds attacked my braja. Therefore, you should punish them. So now, what Krishna is saying is, I can see you're a devotee, so it must have been that these clouds acted independently, that you didn't send them. So Krishna is giving him the benefit of the doubt. And he's allowing Indra to tell the truth of what happened. Indra thought, alas... I cannot be duplicitous with the all-knowing super-soul. Therefore, in this verse, Indra decided to confess that everything was his fault. Krishna and Indra might have had the following conversation. Krishna saying, But Indra, how is it possible for my devotee to do this? In other words, Krishna is coming from the point... Well, you're a devotee, so no devotee is going to try to destroy Braja, so it must have been the clouds just acted independently. And Indra is saying, no, I can't, I can't be dishonest with you. I did it. And then Krishna is saying, but how is it possible for my devotee to do this? And Krishna is saying this, asking Indra, Indra says, I became angry when my worship was stopped. Krishna says, Though I am your master and I stopped your worship, I cannot believe that my servant would do such a thing. Indra says, Anything is possible for one who is falsely proud. Krishna, Though pride may somehow arise in my devotee, he will remove it with intelligence. Indra, Indra says, But intense anger destroys all one's intelligence. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, I may have mentioned this before. That the, the Bhagavatam, you know, one, one part of the Bhagavatam are stories of great devotees, but then the, another, there's other stories in the Bhagavatam like this, like real conditioned souls 
having real issues. And here's a real issue. So, you know, we understand that anger uh, destroys one, is very destructive. And here Indra is, is showing us that even a devotee, if his anger hits a certain threshold, can become angry with Krishna. Amazing, right? And anger is so... It's so powerful. Anger is like a drug. It's just so powerful that it could cause even Indra to forget his position. And so, forget Krishna's position. So Krishna is saying, Indra, how could you forget my position? And Indra is saying, I became so angry that I forgot it. The anger completely destroyed my intelligence. Isn't that amazing? Here's a devotee of Krishna. He becomes angry at Krishna, and that anger has just destroyed him. And so he was trying to destroy the family of Krishna, the most beloved friends of Krishna. I mean, that's horrible. It means complete loss of intelligence. And when I was reading this, I was thinking that, you know, sometimes... You may have seen two very angry people and they're ready to destroy one another and then when it happens in a public place then people grab them and separate them. And so when someone becomes angry they completely become animalistic. And Bhishma Dev said that to become angry is to be subhuman. So this is interesting. It's to become subhuman and it makes you subhuman by taking away your intelligence and then you'll, you'll act like an animal or anger is like a drug. It causes you to say and do things that humans should not say and do. So, that's what's going on. Though I have caused great disturbance to you, I have received your mercy like a sick person being diagnosed and given medicine by a doctor. Thus cured of my disease, I have given up the urge to release my lightning bolts. Because you control everything, you are the Supreme. Ishwaram. Because you give benefit to everyone, you are the spiritual master, Guru. Because you are the supreme object of love, you are the supreme soul, Atmanam. So, we have some comments here. As you said, that the same body we see in the mirror and admire is in fact a reminder for us that we turned our backs on Krishna. Yeah, well, that was stupid. Is it okay to, to be upset with my deities because they take their hats off when it's cold outside? <laughs> no, be upset with yourself that you don't put their hats on right. <laughs> or they don't like those hats and they're taking them off. Um, yeah, it's okay to be upset with Krishna if it's out of love. But Indra's upset wasn't out of love. You know, there's a story like that. It may have been Jagannath Das Babaji or Gorkashore Das Babaji. Some kids were bothering him. And he saw that everything comes from Krishna. So he chastised Krishna. He said, if you don't stop doing this, he saw it as Krishna doing that. If you don't stop doing this, I'll tell Mother Yasoda on you. So, in, in prema, then anger, a devotee will become angry in prema, knowing that that anger will give Krishna pleasure. So if your anger can give your deities pleasure, then you can use it. Otherwise, no. Or if that anger is, is not coming from a transcendental place, then it's, it's material. But anger is called man, and that anger, which the devotee knows, would cause Krishna to become more attracted to that devotee. That's, that's man. And yeah, that anger is used. Radharani gets angry a lot. Um, I have a story that... I was in Mauritius and we didn't have a proper, proper vehicle. And um, it rains a lot. And the devotees have to take bus, buses and get wet and walk through the mud to get to the bus stop. And... One devotee had just come from South Africa and he, he was thinking, this isn't right. So he was upset with Krishna. Why? 
why don't you give a car to these devotees? And he was getting angry with the deities. And that moment, he had to go into town that moment. A friend of his came with a BMW to take him to town. <laughs> so, you know, it depends why you're angry. If it's angry out of love, then it's okay. So, uh, be careful. Uh, Krishna has to like your anger. That's the point. Mm. So, mm -hmm. yes, okay, so there's much more to say about Govardhan, uh, a lot of things are said when we go on Govardhan Parikrama, but um, Govardhan is known as Haridasa Varya, which means he's the best devotee. And so is, but we just read that Govardhan is Krishna. That's true. So when you worship Govardhan Shila, you will worship it either as Krishna, or sometimes you could worship it as Balaram, or you will worship it either as Krishna or Balaram, or you will worship it as a devotee. And you'll treat that as a devotee. So I guess you're asking now, should you worship Govardhan? Well, you can worship the day for sure. Uh, Katie says, I heard some story of that person getting angry on his deities when he's not sure if his house or temple got robbed as the deities didn't protect them from getting robbed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could see a conditioned soul doing that. But you have to see Krishna's pastime from a different perspective. That You know, that's a material way of seeing it. Maybe there was some blessing there, some reason or something. Um, we should never blame Krishna. That's, and Krishna is giving us a lesson and then we blame him for giving us a lesson. That's not good. And you know, you left, if you left the door open and they came in, um, I think somebody left their car open and something was stolen. You know, certainly it would be foolish to blame Krishna. This pastime also shows that the Lord was intolerant towards anyone who puts uh, devotees in difficulty. In this case, Prajabhasi is personally a fence towards the Lord he may forgive. Yeah. Well, Yeah, Krishna is not going to tolerate an offense to his devotees. So, we would be very cautious to not make offense. And Krishna can tolerate an offense to himself, but to his devotees, he cannot tolerate. So, yes. But specifically, he wanted to chastise Indra and put him in his place. And so, both things are going on in this Leela. Uh, yeah, it's necessary. Um, Radha Priya is asking, is it necessary? I mean, devotees have done, I know devotees who have inherited shilas from their parents and they weren't Brahmins and they worshipped them. And their parents were born Brahmins like Indians. So, but yes, you need initiation or... Uh, Generally in India, when they're going to worship Shila, if they worship a Shila as Vishnu and Narayan, then they'll get Upanayanam, Brahminical initiation, and they're allowed to worship the Shila. But Pancharitrik worship, we need full second initiation. So some boys, like in Gurukul, will get the, uh, will get the thread, Upanayanam, not even first initiated, but they get the thread so they can worship. They can do puja. But to do panchuratriki, panchuratriki puja, the way we're doing it in ISKCON, yes, you need, 
you need the full initiation. But the young boys would get upanayanam, brahminical initiation, and then they could chant Vedic mantras with that initiation. But it's generally not done in this kind. It's not like someone's a bhakta, and we say, okay, you want to worship um, Shalagram, so we'll give you upanayanam. You'll chant Gayatri mantra, and, and you'll do your puja. That's generally done like when a boy's about eight, especially from Brahmin families. So, yeah. If you're very into deity worship, then if you have radical qualities, you can request to become second initiated. Yes? Is that okay? It's... If you are qualified, then why not take second initiation? Yes. Second initiation. Yeah. First be steady with first initiation. <laughs> you can worship Gorni Thai now before second initiation. Become qualified. You have to be in Sat Baguna. Yeah, be situated in Sat Waguna. You know, if you chant Gayatri Mantra and you're not in Sat Waguna, it doesn't have an effect. It's like, you ever chant Japa and you're totally in passion or ignorance? And you're just not in the mood and you can feel that your chanting is not having an effect because you're not in the, in the right mood. So if you're Brahmana, if you have Gayatri Mantra and the Panchavatriki Mantras, but you're not living a life in goodness, then the mantras, they, they, you have to be in goodness for the mantras to work. So it's not just, you, know, you just get initiation and boom, everything changes. You have to be qualified to do it properly. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> say, can I have a, can I have a, Can I have an automatic weapon? Like that. Yeah, but you have to know how to use it. It's not just like you have an automatic weapon, you know, you're going to you know, do a coup d'etat and take over the government. What's, you don't even know how to use it. So you get a mantra, but you're in the mode of passion, you don't know how to use the mantra. So, But it's even true with the Hare Krishna mantra. Because I was just talking with a devotee today. How... The Prabhupada says, in many places, Prabhupada said, when you hear something, whether it's the Maha Mantra, or Brahma Samhita, or Song of the Acharya, you should try to enter the mood. Like, what is the mood of this song? What is the mood of this Acharya? What is the mood of the Maha Mantra? So I was thinking this morning, the Maha Mantra has a mood. It's very much Krishna, please help me. And so what is your mood when you're chanting? Because your mood may be completely opposite from the mood of the mantra. Oh, Katie, don't worry about Gayatri Mantra. Don't worry yet. Um, so the mood of the Maha Mantra is Krishna. I want to be a pure devotee. Uh, Krishna, I want to be a pure devotee. I want to serve you. I want nothing to do with this world. I want, I want to be able to give up all material desires and only desire to serve you. That's that's the frequency, the vibration. That's what it is. That's what. That's how should we say this? The word mood, you know, like, like you're going to some formal event and like, like the Academy Awards and everybody's wearing tuxedos and all, all the 
ladies are wearing these long, uh, amazing gowns. That's, that's the mood. You can't just show up in t-shirt and jeans. There's a certain mood there. Right? And so, if you're not in that mood, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. It's just, it's out of place. It doesn't communicate. So, the songs... Gayatri Mantra, the Maha Mantra, there's a certain mood. And so, if you're singing them and you're not in the mood, then you're not benefiting, nothing's happening. It's like, it's like nothing. It's like sometimes I give the example that you're a professional singer and you're hired to sing songs. Karaoke at a party. And so you're singing all these songs. And you don't really know much about them and you're not really in the mood. You just sing them because you get paid. So, but, there, but there's a certain mood that the song was originally sung in by the person who wrote the song. They were feeling it. So you're supposed to actually be in that mood when you sing that song and that communicates it. So when you're chanting your Gayatri or chanting your rounds, you're supposed to be in the mood which is the mood of that mantra. So if you're not in the mood of that mantra, then it's like that somebody goes to the Academy Awards and they don't really know what's going on and it's just peeking their eye in there and um, they're wearing t-shirts and jeans. And that's it. It's just, they're like, it's like, like sometimes you know, you're, you're talking with somebody or there's a group of you and you're talking and then a, another person comes in and they're in a totally different mood and they change the conversation. They just, they don't fit in. It's the wrong mood. You know, they're talking about something totally different. So it's like the Maha Mantra is like this vibration. Krishna, give me pure bhakti. And then we come in. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Just got to get this done with. It was just totally not in the mood. So it's like nothing's happening. It's like, it's like we're going against the very mood of the mantra. So unless you're in the mood of Gayatri, and that's at least in Satwaguna, then when you chant it, it's like it doesn't work. It's like you're not you can't access the mantra without being sattvic at least. Um, when I pray to Krishna in this mood that I don't want anything, but only bhakti, he puts me on the test, yeah. Well, why don't you put him on a test? All right, I'll explain how to do that. Because it's a fact that we live in a material world and have families and do need material benefits. Can I, how can I change that experience? Well, Prabhupada said that uh, we shouldn't ask for anything material, but sometimes um, grihastas can pray for something material. <laughs> they have to out of necessity. But if you want to test Krishna, yeah, say, Krishna, I'll pray for pure bhakti, and you can take it away, and I'll have total faith. And then when you have total faith and they're happy that everything's perfect, then he'll give you back more. So maybe you got half the equation right, and you failed in the second half. So. No, you can put him to the test. What's the test? I told the devotee, she said, I don't have faith in Krishna. And I said, test him. How do I test him? Well, he says, if you do this and that, I'll take care of you. So I said, test him. He said it. So she's a substitute teacher. And so she said, okay. Well, you know, and I go to these classes. They want me to like help the kids eat their meat and cut their meat and this and serve it. And so she just went in there and said, okay, I'll test Krishna. You know, I can do my service without do my job without having to touch the meat. And she just told the people, I was like, I can't touch this, it's against my religion. And they, they were, said, oh, that's fine, we'll arrange for someone else to do it. So that's like testing, you know. You know, you hold on to your principles, okay, Krishna, I'm, I'm gonna test you. Will you let me hold on to my principles? Or I'm going to do this with faith in you that you will take care of things. So I'm gonna test you because you said you would. So. But you can't test Krishna if you don't have the faith. Mm. Yeah, if you're failing in that equation, it'll keep happening. So when things happen, there's lessons there. And so you think what the lesson is, how Krishna's testing you, what does he want you to learn, and then you'll see when you learn the lesson, 
Mm-hmm. Then you learn you you learn the lesson, and everything's good, and that becomes an experience which now you can apply the rest of your life. I put my faith in Krishna. Krishna took care of me, so now I'm confident he'll take care of me in all other ways. But I didn't. I was afraid to put that much faith in Krishna, so. I didn't see him taking care of me, and I don't have that faith. That's so. That's what's happening for many of us. Yes. So that's what I mean by test Krishna. Test Krishna means Krishna says, "I'll take care of you in this way or that way." So test him. That's what he said. Test him means to see if he's actually telling the truth. I think he is. Yeah, he's cool. He really cares about you. Um. Guru Nishta, Krishna cares about you. That's why he's, he's doing things that are helping to purify you, because you need it. And as you become more purified, your life will get easier in many ways. Maybe difficult in other ways, but Krishna is so... Just thank you, Krishna's kind. He's taking care of me. The lesson is maybe, I don't know, you'll have to decide. Maybe, I don't know what's going on inside you to know what the lesson is. Maybe more faith is required. Or maybe the lesson is you made a bad decision and there's bad results. And, you know, the lesson can be if I make a bad decision, I can't expect Krishna to bail me out. That would be like jumping out of a window. And, Expecting that gravity wouldn't function. I mean, that could happen. Mystical things like that do happen, but in general, it wouldn't happen like that. Okay, I'm going to have to sign off. So, it's now 8.17. And in four, in seven hours, less than seven hours, six hours and 40 minutes or so, 43 minutes, we're going to have another class on Dhammadar. So if you want to come later, you're welcome. Okay? So I'm going to sign off because I'm not fully awake right now. Hare Krishna. Sri the Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gauda Premanandi.